present this award to my dear colleague and friend, Dr. Eleanor Criswell. And I want to thank Dr. Donna Rockwell here. I have been, um, I've been agitating for years about more women in humanistic psychology, and often in the textbooks, the same three men get quoted over and over. <laughs> so um, this is thrilling for the first time award. You have pretty extensive bios on your sheets, so we don't have to repeat those, but what I would like to say is that Dr. Criswell is, 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 is known for her modesty and is remarkable for her modesty and her inability and her uh, disinclination to call attention to herself. She served as president of more boards, committees, international organizations. She's the mother of Saybrook University that yes. has given birth to many of yes. us here and has very quietly just held the space that all this can happen. And I particularly appreciate what she has also very diligently, quietly, for a long time brought into the field, personally important to me, which is the role of the body. Uh, she works with planosomatics, and something else that um, is in small print here, but I find thrilling, is that she works with animals now. Some of us have worked, talked about human-animal interaction. She works with horses and horses and their riders and other animals. She's branching the International Yoga Association, all kinds of areas that really have to do with a very, very wide vision of the human experience. So let me turn it all the way back to her. Psychological hypnosis, 
and it was talking about bringing in a new way of doing hypnosis in which it was collaboration, in which he, <laughs> rather than authoritarian, it was, it was cute, actually. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and many other things. With this small group has had such a big effect, and the other people who are humanistic psychologists, whether they know it or not, who are out there sharing the principles and values, continue to have a very big role. And so I think of this award as honoring the women who are in this division, but way beyond that. And so wherever women are along the path toward actualization, this award celebrates them. If we look at the forces that humanistic psychology originally countered, you can see that psychoanalysis and behaviorism and the attempt to be highly objective in research are all highly cognitive. And they are very left hemisphere dominant. And I have to tell you that my very dear brother is a psychoanalyst. And we have these wonderful <laughs> discussions. <laughs> Humanistic psychology historically brought in the affective and personal dimensions. In the field of humanistic psychology and the human potential movement, there was a great deal that had to do with relationships and love. Lots of love. <laughs> Lots of caring going on. The qualities of the human being, humanistic psychology, wanted to recognize had been to a degree left out of the other approaches to psychology. <clears throat> Many years ago I was attending a, a, whatever it was, a conference maybe, <laughs> and one of the sessions it had to do with maybe, um, whatever it had to do with, uh, statistics in psychology. <clears throat> and the person hosting it said, you know, I used to be a humanistic psychologist, but now I am a cognitive psychologist. And I thought, right. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> In working with your people, you are still a humanistic psychologist. You wouldn't have the same rapport if you didn't bring in some of those qualities. And I was the only person who stood up in that room and said, I'm a humanistic psychologist. Which reminds me, I was going to tell you that I am now 80 years old. And I am a historical relic. I have been there <laughs> during everything that happened. <laughs> so you can ask me about it. <laughs> anyway, women have always been involved. We admire our founding fathers. As Eileen, was, I guess was Eileen saying, you know the quotes of the three great men. And there were many more great men. Not just these three, there were a few more. Uh, and, but we're not as aware of our founding fathers. And as I look at the wives of these men, and I knew uh, Bertha as well, and I never knew Helen, I knew Antoinette Gerard, Gerard, Tony Gerard, very well, and <clears throat> heard about others. They were all very much a part of what their men were able to do. Um, Antoinette Gerard, who is no longer living, Tony Gerard, could tell great stories about how she shared certain things with Sydney, and he went out and did them. <laughs> Not and talked about them and so forth and so on. Anyway, and all the other women who participated as members of conferences, or they were students, or they were clients, or they were friends, and they were sharing their perspectives all the way along the way. What humanistic psychology was bringing in was the affective side of human existence. And I love the new field that is developing, I hope it continues, of affective cognitive neuroscience. <clears throat> because it wants to bring together psychology, behavior, um, neuroscience, um, evolutionary psychology into looking at the human being and bringing in the human side of the human being. And wonderful research. Anyway, this award celebrates the women. And um, we have to acknowledge the men in humanistic psychology who had very developed feminine sides. In fact, they were why women were brought in. Because they said, let's, 
let's invite them in. I think they have some interesting things to say. If you look at Clark and Stars, very highly developed feminine side. Mm -hmm. Abraham Maslow also, and others very developed. And um, so, anyway, we're we're celebrating the feminine dimension wherever we find it. We are in the process of defining gender more broadly. Humanistic psychology can bring in a great deal to that process. The spectrum of human characteristics and potential need to be defined broadly. <clears throat> I love some of the things that Margaret Mead said about different cultures encourage certain characteristics and discourage others. And that's part of the female role, is encouraging certain characteristics and others who are discouraged. In modern times, we are inviting all of the traits to be expressed. So some of those traits that were encouraged included gentleness, empathy, sensitivity, caring, compassion, tolerance, nurturance, and we need to add to the list strength, resilience, awareness, intuition. Worldwide, women bring heart into their endeavors. They tend to be more empathic, they tend to be more connected, more concerned with relationships. In my life, I have always followed my heart. Brain research has shown that women are less lateralized than men. I love the way of saying that. <laughs> Lateralization is what you should be. You should be lateralized, but there are those that are less lateralized. <laughs> and that be is because women have a larger corpus callosum, yes. the connection between the two hemispheres, especially the posterior corpus callosum. And there's a greater connection between the hemispheres. And we can look at why that happened evolutionarily. You know, why did that encourage some women survive to have larger corpus callosums? But what it does is um, it encourages them to express traits from both hemispheres. So many years I was writing an article, Thomas and I, Thomas Hannah and I were writing a book <coughs> on the pipe smoker based on some of my research. So I was looking at some of the books that had been written about male psychology. <clears throat> and I discovered that in the library, there were um, a lot of shelves for women's books. And there were just a few shelves for men's books. And I said, that's not fair. Why, the, how, why are there so many more? And then I realized the rest of the library was the men's books. <laughs> changed some since then, <laughs> but anyway, um, 1973 Journal of Humanistic Psychology lists the following topics of special interest for the humanistic psychologist. Authenticity, encounter, self-actualization, search for meaning, creativity, personal growth, personal health, being motivation, values, love, identity, and commitment. Many of these topics align with the female dimension. <clears throat> so I'm not going to share with you all these qualities of the principles of the humanistic psychologist, but we're all familiar with them. The worth and dignity of the person, actualizing personal potential, embracing person-centered, and just uh, Eileen was talking about my work with horses. Um, in my work with horses, we do person, we do horse-centered work. So it is the, it is the horse who is people will ask me well is this for the is this for the human no no actually it's for the horse <laughs> we're doing semantics with the horse and they love it they <laughs> respond wonderfully anyway self-direction self-regulation and so forth i use as a humanistic psychologist <clears throat> i bring those principles into everything that i do and so that includes all of the different applications of working with human beings. <clears throat> and uh, I am very aware of the fact that these principles have spread to many orientations to psychology. It is amazing how that has worked. So the humanistic psychologists, they didn't really also, though some of them did, intend to try to change psychology. Some of them did think about that. But by and large, they just set up business next door and had a wonderful time. <laughs> and the other psychologist looked over and said, hmm, 
there's something, there's something going on over there. <laughs> and, but it has a, a huge effect on, so it has had a huge effect on me as well. And that is, I have become more eclectic and inclusive. I've used principles from behaviorism and biofeedback and other areas. I have, I use cognitive work in my psychotherapy. I'm very much blend, but particularly body, mind, and spirit, a very holistic view of the human within a balanced global environment. So it sounds, humanistic sounds anthropocentric, I know you went into that before, but actually if we expand the definition, is the human being as part of a balanced um, global environment. And we really need to pay a lot of attention to that these days. Neuroscience and neurophysiology research can, research can be enormously helpful for humanistic psychology. And I know some of you are very not interested in that, but there are some of you who are very interested in that. As research has been so helpful with the mindfulness meditation movement. Current research in heart rate variability, says some of our biofeedbackers here, like Stephen Sidorov and on both side over there. Uh, heart rate variability shows that emotions such as gratitude and appreciation increase your heart rate variability. So one of my thoughts in this, in talking with you about how much I appreciate everything, was that we would be sharing some increased heart rate variability. <coughs> Heart rate variability is a measure of psychological emotional state. It increases when we are healthy. It decreases when we are unhealthy. So things that increase it, even if you're not being hooked to biofeedback devices showing your heart rate variability has increased, um, will increase that. One time I was sitting in a faculty meeting. <laughs> I'm a member of our faculty here. <coughs> of Sonoma State University, and, um, and we were, believe it or not, we were arguing over something. We were having an argument about something. And I said, you know, let's talk about how much we appreciate each thing. So we went around the circle and each person talked about what they, you remember, Heather? <laughs> what they talked about. And the thing is, when you talk about what you appreciate, your heart rate variability increases, and your state of coherence and general health increases, and so forth. So many principles of humanistic psychology would lend themselves to fMRI and other psychophysiological studies. Every one of them we could demonstrate, and it would be a powerful, powerful message about the values of humanistic psychology. Anyway, I love potential wherever I find it. Animals, plants, humans, and so forth. And um, I was originally mentored when I was coming along at the University of um, Kentucky, where I did my undergraduate degree and half of my master's, um, by a woman whose name was Belinda Proudfoot. She was a woman in the education department. She was the first professor to ever recognize that it was a huge um, inspiration from that. At that point, not long after that, I fell in love with education as a deliberate contribution to human development. <clears throat> At that time, I was 21 years old. I made a commitment to do whatever I could to contribute to the development of humankind. And that's what I've done over the past 60 years. I've done whatever I could, wherever I could, wherever. So I want to thank the people. How are we doing on time? Pardon? We're at the time. I want to thank the people in Division 32 for creating this in the 1971s or so. Um, because it has been a very special home for us in, for example, at Sonoma State University. It has been a, a defense, a, a confirmation, a help as we battle various forces at the university who would want us to change 
her orientation to psychology. And to be able to say, well, Division 32 is the humanistic psychologist division of APA, and they're doing this, that, and the other thing, and, and various administrators will say, well, okay, I guess it's a legitimate thing that you have done. <laughs> it was very helpful, and I know other faculty members, single faculty members in other universities were greatly comforted by the work of Division 32. So it's been great to be part of it. I also enjoy the, the founding of Sabre University. Yes. I enjoy uh, meeting people who have graduated from Sabre or who are faculty there. And 